as being a polynomial in S over a denominator polynomial in S. And I put the subscript C to represent controller. Okay? All right. So if the transfer function of the controller looks like this or can be arranged or it look like this, it's a PID controller. Okay? If it's only PI, it doesn't have that term. Whatever. Okay? And I'll show you this in a minute. Um, but now I'm not going to restrict the controller to look like this or equivalently like this. It can be anything. Okay? And oh yeah, by the way, we tend to call this thing GC of S, right? The controller transfer function. All right. Um, so to do these kind of designs, you notice it's called model-based design. You need a model. Okay? So everything we're doing here assumes that there's going to um, a transfer function model of the controller. So the idea here is I give you the process transfer function, call it GP of S, and you give me back the controller transfer function for that. Okay? So this is, this is how we do the design. So implicit in this, or actually explicit, is you have to have a model. Okay? It's not restricted to any particular model form. It can be applied to any model in principle, as I'll show you. Okay? And it makes full use of the model. So what we've done before, right, if we have a model, we might use the model to figure out tuning parameters, and then we simulate how that controller does against that model on in Simulink and see if we like it. I wouldn't call that fully using the model, okay? And in many cases, but not all, you will get a PID controller. And if you do, it provides another means of tuning a PID controller. All right. Okay, so the, tell me, this looks familiar. What is this? So this is a typical feedback system, right? Um, so we have a disturbance entering a transfer function. We have the manipulated input entering a transfer function. Those two things add up to give you the output. We measure it. We compare it to the set point in the same unit. Send that signal to a controller. That sends a signal P to a valve, which ultimately changes something U that changes the process. Okay, so we're manipulating U to try to make Y equal to the set point. We've seen this before over and over again at this point. Okay? All right. So typically we have this transfer function, right? So we have a transfer function that involves all these different elements here. Okay. The point I'm trying to make on this slide, which I already alluded to here, I didn't justify it here, but I will now, is that if you're in a plant, you can't tell the dynamics of the valve, the process, and the measurement apart from each other. You understand? You send a signal from the computer to the process, and out comes a measurement. You can't easily isolate the dynamics of the valve or the measurement device. So, the way to think about this is, let's just call this whole thing the process. From this point here to this point here is essentially the process, because we can't tell the valve apart from the process apart from the sensor. Okay? So that's what I've done here. Okay? So I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to simplify this transfer function. You should like this, because it looks simpler. Okay? I'm going to make the following simplification. First of all, I'm going to assume the measurement device is just a gain, which it, essentially the measurement device and the valve are essentially always gains, or can be treated that way. Because if they're not, if the dynamics of these things are appreciable compared to that, you've got a bad valve and a bad sensor. Okay, so let's assume we have good sensors, they're fast, and therefore they can just be represented as gains. So for the measurement device, I have a gain, and now I'm going to define something called G, just to be these things multiplied together. Sensor, valve, process. Okay? And then if you do this, you can rewrite this transfer function like this. Because what do you have in the numerator? You have the KM. G, V, G, P, that's what I call G, and then you have the G, C, you get the G, C there. And because we've assumed G, M is equal to K, M, you can write the same thing down here, 1 plus that, okay? So for the foreseeable future, if not ever, um, this is the way we'll want to write closed loop transfer functions. We no longer want to differentiate between these different elements. We'll, we'll just talk about G and G, C, okay? G is the process dynamics. It includes the valve and the measurement device. GC is the controller. And there's our transfer function. Okay? Makes life a little bit easier. And then the block diagram for that now, which you'll see drawn a lot, will look like this. I don't even know why I have to look over there. But anyway. I guess I'll draw a disturbance here for completeness. Doesn't really matter.
Okay. So instead of writing that, which is unwieldy and I don't like it, because I can barely draw this one, um, we'll draw it like this. So everything, the, the real simplification here is that the, these three things have been lumped together into a single thing called G. Okay? All right. And in fact, if you wanted to prove this was the, that this block diagram gave you that closed loop transfer function, you could apply that formula I gave you. You probably don't remember it, but I'll recapitulate it here. It says if you want to know the closed loop transfer function between <coughs> any two points, namely, let's say between y and ysp, in the numerator goes all the, it was, was I wrote it like this, pi e 1 plus pi f. And this pi e is all the transfer functions that are in the path between here and here. That's those two. That's it, right? G times GC. And then pi f is everything that's in the feedback loop. Everything in the feedback loop is the same too. All right? So G times GC. So that, that's what I have over there. Because the order doesn't matter. Well, I have G times GC there too. Okay, fine. All right. So the idea is that we're going to deal with the transfer function now looking like this, closed loop transfer function that's consistent with a block diagram that looks like that. And that's justifiable under the assumption that you've lumped these things together. All right? Good. All right. So now I've just rewritten this thing, right? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, in order to do design, okay, I'm going to take this equation and I'm going to solve it for GC. So hopefully you can. It's just an algebraic quantity, right? I'm going to solve this equation for GC, and if you do that, you get this. Trust me on this one. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to use this to design GC now. And obviously, in order to design GC, I need to know everything on the right-hand side. I know G because that's the process transfer function. Someone's going to give me that. Okay. But at this point, I don't know what y and over ysp is, because that's usually not something I specify. That's normally something I compute. <laughs> right? So now I'm going to specify this. Okay? And I'm going to say, I want this ratio. right? This is the closed loop response, right? how the output responds to the set point, all in Laplace domain. I'm going to specify what I want this thing to be. I'm going to call it some desired value. I and mean, I'm going to call that desired transfer function GD. Okay? So you see the differences? I'm specifying that this thing should equal GD and solving for GC. What I used to do is I specified GC and then I figured out what this thing was. Right? That's what calculating the response is. You basically calculate this thing. So now it's reverse. Instead of specifying the controller and figuring out the response, I'll specify what I want the response to be and figure out the controller. So it's design opposite way. Okay? And with this definition here, you can take this equation and you can rewrite it like this. Okay, this is the basic design equation. And this GD here is the desired closed loop transfer function. I still haven't told you what it is. I've just told you that I'm going to specify it. <laughs> and I'll tell you what it is in a minute. Okay? All right. So if you notice the controller transfer function here, you'll notice one characteristic is it involves 1 over G. Okay? So it's proportional to the inverse of the process transfer function. So the way to think about that is that if you want to have some arbitrary response between here and here that you choose, which we call GD, then the first thing the controller has to do is cancel G. Because right? the dynamics of this loop here are dependent clearly on G. So what the first thing the controller is going to do is eliminate the, the effect of G by canceling it. That's, we'll see if I, I'd be very accurate here. That's what that says, 1 over g. Okay. So this is what this statement says. That it depends on the inverse of this model. And it, the reason it depends on 1 over g is because it just cancels g out. Okay. So the way to think about this equation is it cancels g out and then puts in what it wants in its place, which is gd. The reason this thing looks weird is because it's a feedback system, and it's got to look like that to make that, this thing happen, to make this equal GD. Okay? All right. So this thing here, this, we'll call many things. We'll call this the controller transfer function. We'll call it the control law. We'll call it the control algorithm. Okay? It's the equation for GC. So in order to implement this, clearly, you have to have a G available, and I have to tell you what GD is. 
The way the method works is I give you a GD, you, I either give you or you specify what the GD is. Okay, so let's see how this works. All right. So let, let, let's just skip ahead. Sometimes this, uh, the slides are easier done in a different order. So I'm going to come back to that slide. So here's what I want, for example, the most common choice of GD is. Okay? And the slide before tells you all the nuances of, of constraints on how you might pick this. But let's just say I pick this. You might say, why, why pick that? And I guess my response is, why wouldn't you? Um, do you remember we had the lecture on closed loop responses where you had to calculate what this thing was? You remember that? You specify, I'd give you a controller transfer function, a valve, a measurement device, a controller, and then you would find out what exists over here. Right? And then you would multiply across by the set point, like a step change, take the inverse Laplace transform and find y, y of t. It wasn't fun, and it also wasn't guaranteed to be anything you like. Right? Now I'm doing something very much different. I'm telling you that I've designed the controller so that this thing is equal to GD of s, and this thing, based on what I've written on the board there, looks like this. First order, gain of 1, time constant tau c. OK. So, um, so if you were to do a set point change, well, I mean, we know what a first order system looks like, right? I don't need to compute the response. We studied this ad nauseum. So if I were to do a set point change like that, so this is the y set point, we know what this gives us. It gives us a first order response with a time constant tau c, and it has a gain of 1. So in other words, it looks like this. Okay. And if we think that's not fast enough, we can make the tau c smaller, and we can make it go even faster. Or if we think it's too fast, we can cause the tau c to be, make it larger, and it'll go slower. It'll always look first order, and it'll always go exactly to the set point, because the gain is 1. Okay. So now, you can think of it as the tuning of the controller is simply reduced to figure out what you'd like the tau c to be. It's much cleaner, right? Before you PI controller three parameters, specify them. You don't know how. You don't know how they affect response. Plug them all in. Take the inverse Laplace transform. See if you like what you got. If you don't, do it again. Okay. Now I'm, you you specify what you want. You're guaranteed to get it, as long as the model's perfect. Okay. We're going to talk about that later. Okay. Um, so it's much much nicer, much cleaner, and it's it's um, the advantage of doing design instead of analysis. Let's say. Okay. So th why do I choose this? Because there's nothing simpler you can choose. You can't choose a, a, a number one, right? Because uh, you can't expect, so this is what, how you want the closed loop system to respond. Okay? You can't expect the closed loop system to, like if you do a set point change, to instantaneously get from here to here. Because the, the system has inertia. You can't change things instantaneously. right? That's what dynamics are. So you have to accept there's going to be some dynamics. And what dynamics are simpler than that? First order. That's the simplest dynamics there are. Okay? With an adjustable time constant that we can choose to get any speed we want. And a gain of 1, so we're guaranteed not to have offset. It almost seems too perfect to be true. It's one of the few times in life where it is, it is true, though. Also have some real estate in Louisiana we can talk about after class. Okay. Um, all right. So. This tau c had better be positive, right? Because otherwise, this response is first order and unstable. So it's going to be positive. It's a number you're going to choose. And the cool thing now is, remember that whole lecture we had on stability? Like, how are we going to take these controller parameters to be stable? You know, we had that one, like it was stable between minus 1 and 12.8 or something like that. We're like, remember that whole thing? We argued about the minus 1 part. OK. Um, now, this is guaranteed to be stable for any tau c greater than 1. I mean, you look at this. This is a stable response as long as tau c is positive. So the whole idea of stability is eliminated. It's always going to be stable. So we don't have to worry about that problem. That's great. Um, it has a gain of 1, right? So you're guaranteed that the controller, and I'll show you this. It would be better shown an example. The controller is guaranteed to have integral action, guaranteed not to have offset, right? You, you, it's, not, it's not that easy to see this now. When I actually design a controller, actually use this formula here, I'll show you. It's got integral action. Okay? 
All right. Um, so this seems, this seems almost unbelievable, right? All the problems that we used to have are eliminated. It's like a self-help program, all right? And so now you need to pick the tau c. Now there are some caveats on tau c. You can't pick tau c arbitrarily, or it's not wise to. So let's say you have a process and it has an inherent time constant of 10 minutes, okay? So this tau here, I'm call, you, know, you remember we have this idea of the dominant process time constant. So this is the dominant characteristic response time of the process. Let's say it's 10 minutes. You can't ask your controller to have a characteristic response time of one second. It's not natural, okay, right? You can't make a system that responds normally with a time constant of 10 minutes respond in one second. It just won't, it, what will happen? Well, first of all, you won't be able to do it. Why? Because even though we haven't worried about it now, we have an input, and this input usually has constraints, upper and lower constraints, right? So if you wanted to make a system, it is true, this is true, right? If you had a tank that looked like that, and it was a little teeny tiny tank, and you had an inlet pipe that looked like that, you can really change the level quickly, right? But that's not the way people design plants because that's a waste of money, right? So this has some dynamics. If you want to change the level in this tank, you got a little pipe. And there's only so much fluid you can put in there at a time, and there's only so much you can change the level at a time, and you can't make the system respond, you know, orders of magnitude faster than it naturally w wants to. So if it has a natural response time of tau, my argument here is that you can make it a little bit faster than it is without control, but not like orders of magnitude, maybe twice as fast. That's what this says. So instead of having a response time of 10 minutes, maybe you can make it five minutes, but you can't make it one second instead of 10 minutes or something like that. Okay, the reason I mention this is because now the problem of tuning the controller is going to be reduced to picking tau c, and this is a reasonable starting point. But you can see tau c has a really easy res effect on the response, right? It's going to speed it up. I'm just arguing you can't speed it up arbitrarily. So this is a good starting point. And this is to be contrasted with kc, where we had no idea what kc would do, right? We just had a feeling if it was too big, that'd be bad. If it was too small, it'd be too slow maybe somewhere in the middle, wherever that is, okay? So this is really nice. All right. And so the point I make here is that sometimes, in very few cases, this GD won't be a good idea, okay? Um, because you do have to worry about once you use this GD in this formula right here, okay? Right here, right? So you're going to take your process transfer function, you're going to plug in your GD here, that I just specified. You're going to simplify this. You're going to get a controller transfer function. You have to worry about whether this thing is implementable, right? What does it mean to be implementable? Well, things have to be implemented in the time domain, right? Because you don't go into a plant and implement things in the Laplace domain, OK? So what this slide is, and I think I'll do this pretty quickly. So when it's all said and done, just like I did that I erased, <laughs> You can represent any controller like this, a numerator polynomial over a denominator polynomial. I did, I did it for the PI controller and then, then erased it, okay? All right, the orders of these things matter, okay? So I'm, I'm not going to really prove this to you, but you, you can take my word for it, I hope, is that, so this has an order M and this has an order N. At this point, it's just written to be arbitrary orders, okay? If these two orders are, if N is, greater than or equal to m, in other words, the order of this thing is greater than the order of this thing, then we say the controller is proper, or more generally, you say the transfer function is proper. And that means, even though it's not going to be easy for you to see, that, that you'll have a controller that will not have any derivative action in it, which is OK, because derivative action is not my favorite thing anyway. Okay? Controllers don't have to have derivative action to work. OK, if this order here is one less than the order here. In other words, this thing is second order and this thing is first order. Then you'll find out the controller has derivative action, which can be OK. okay? However, if the order of this thing is two, two greater than the order of this thing, so this thing is three and this thing is one, then you get double derivative action. The controller wants to take the second derivative of the air signal. That's probably not a good idea. If you don't like the first derivative, you definitely won't like the second. Okay. So the idea here is if you end up with a controller, um, if you end up with a process transfer function that is something like third order, okay, then it might be possible that 
if you plug in this thing that's first order, you'll get a controller you'll have a hard time implementing. We'll come back to that. So that's what this slide is meant to talk about. That's why I'd want to do it second. Okay. This just says we have to make sure the controller we ultimately get is implementable. But for now, let's see how this works, right? Because at this point, it's all just a big theory. All right. So here's an example, a couple of examples. So let's say the system is first order. That means you have this transfer function. Okay. So at this point, I'm specifying arbitrary controller uh, first order transfer function has a gain k, a time constant tau. All right. This is the, I told you this is what we like. This is our desired closed loop response. First order gain of one time constant tau c. Okay. So, I guess I did some simple. I should have done this. Sorry. Let me come back to this. My fault. So, if you take this expression here for G D, and you plug it into wrong direction, you plug it in here, right there, and right there. You can simplify this thing. Okay. You just you put in one over tau C S plus one there and there, and if you do the simplification you will find it looks like that. So that, that 1 over what GD over 1 minus GD term simplifies to look like that. You can do the algebra. It's not hard. Okay? So that means if I'm satisfied with that choice okay, for the GD, this is my design formula. So do you, to basically, it's trivial to implement, right? You give me the G, and I'll just put 1 over G, and I'm done. Okay? So here's an example. First order G, um, there's my GD. And we know that GD gives you this expression here, because I just told you that. Now plug in the G here, okay? So you get right K tau s plus one appears in the numerator. You get this thing, okay? So this is my controller transfer function. All right. So a common game that we play here is to ask ourselves: Is this something we are familiar with? Which means P P I or P I D controller, right? So my argument is I can rearrange this guy to look like a P I controller. How do I know that? Well, I think, and I, I wish I wouldn't have erased. <laughs> I'll probably want this next, but I'm going to go ahead and erase it too. I told you that we can write a PI. Well, let's just say here's a PI controller. It can be equivalently written as this. Right, same thing. Just got a common denominator. So that tells me if I can rearrange my controller transfer function to look like this, what does it mean to look like this? It means I need a first order polynomial in the numerator, and I need a first order polynomial in the denominator, but I can't have a constant in the denominator, just an S term. Okay? Then it's a PI controller. And if I look at this equation, I can see I can do it, right? Because I can see the numerator looks like that and the denominator looks like that. So now it's just a matter of rearranging it. Like anything in algebra, when you rearrange, it's nice to know what your rearranging is possible to achieve, right? So the first thing I do is look at that, yeah, look at this, they have the same structure. So I can do the rearrangement. If you do that, if you want to make it look like this here, it's actually easier usually to rearrange it to look like this. But I'm rearranging it to look like this. Okay? You can rearrange this thing here to look like that. Okay? That's a PI controller in this form. That is the KC right there, that thing there. And then the tau i equals tau. So if you use this formula, you'd say, ah, oh, I found a PI controller. Um, the KC for my PI controller is equal to tau divided by K times tau C. And the integral time, eh, I have trouble writing tau's today. Um, the integral time is just equal to the process time constant. Okay, right? I'm just comparing that to that. That's what I obtained. That's the that's the equation for a PI controller. So I can figure out the KC and tau i. So this is a, this is another way to tune a PI controller. If you have the first order transfer function available, then you know the K and tau. You pick the tau c, and now you have KC and tau i values. You have a PI controller. Okay? And when you go in the book, I, I, I forget what table it is, table 12.5, there's a whole table of these kind of formulas. It goes like this. It says G, so it would have an entry like, and then it has things over here like KC, tau I, and dare I say behind the board, um, tau D. Okay? 
And then it has these corresponding formulas, like for this transfer function, it's equal to tau. For this transfer function, it's equal to tau um, over k. Now I can't even speak. Um, tau <laughs> divided by k times tau c. So this provides another way to tune a controller. We'll come back to that. All right, so that's easy enough. That gave you a PI controller. Now let's say the system is second order instead of first order. Okay? So now our transfer function looks like this. And again, we're going to specify a desired transfer function that looks like this. And we're going to plug it into this formula. That's all it comes down to. Okay? So to plug into this formula means you need to put 1 over g. So there's the, one, there's the numerator. There's the denominator of g. You flip them over. You get this. Okay. Now I ask myself, what's that? And in particular, I asked myself, is that a PID controller or a PI controller or something? Right? We have a particular obsession with PI and PID controllers. So even if we do something different, we always want to come back to them if we can. Because if you went to a plant and went into a distributed control system in a plant, it would have P and PID controllers. It wouldn't have arbitrary transfer function. Okay, so you have an interest in seeing if you can rearrange to be P or PID. I'll show you in Simulink we can implement anything we want. Okay. All right, so first thing I notice is that, and this is the thing <laughs> I wrote and erased. I'm going to write it again. This is a PID controller. Okay. It is equivalently like this. Okay, that's an equivalent. All I get is get a common denominator. There's the derivative term. There's the proportional term. There's the integral term. I just wrote them in order of decreasing power of s for simplicity. Okay. All right. So then I look up here at what I obtained, and I'm like, this looks promising, right? Because if I multiply this thing out, it's going to be a second-order polynomial on s. And if I look at the denominator, it's something involving s, no constant. So yeah, I'm going to be able to do it. Okay. Again, the easier way to do it is to just work, compare it to this form directly rather than this form. Because it's easier, obviously, if you multiply this out, you'll very quickly see what this stuff is. I've just written it in this form because that's what you're most familiar with. So what did I do here? You can see I did a lot of algebra. You'll do less algebra to put it in <laughs> this form than this form. But I, I did the, I, I don't know, I didn't like myself. I went ahead and did the algebra for the other form. And then I rearrange this thing to look like this. You just have to trust me on this. Okay? The key thing is not whether you can do algebra, I hope. It's whether what you're trying to do is even achievable. So the key step here is to realize this has the right form in order to be a PID controller. Okay? Or a PI controller. Whatever. Rearrange this to look like this. And then I can see by comparison to this PI for PID formula, that's the KC. OK, one, that thing in the numerator there, tau 1 plus tau 2 is the tau i. And then the tau d is this whole ratio thing. Okay, And again, if you went into a table, you'd see that entry for the model. And then you'd see those entries for k, tau i, and tau d. All right? So in this case, you get a PI controller. In this case, you get a PID controller. OK, now hopefully you can see there's a potential problem coming here. Because if, if this thing was third order, okay, right, third order down here, otherwise looking the same, then when you got to this point, this would be third order up here, right? The order of this numerator would be third, and then the de denominator would be first order. This is this case over here that I told you we don't like, right? So that would be a, a controller that takes the second derivative of the air. In order to see that, you have to go take it back to the time domain, which I don't want to do. So if that was the case, this was third order, I wouldn't pick this. This is not a good choice. I'll tell you what I would pick. I'm sure I'll want something here. but So what I'm telling you, just for completeness here, is if the g looked like something like this, So it is, not only can I not write tau today, but every tau looks different than the tau before. Um, OK. So it looks like that, OK? Third order. Then I would pick 
the GD of S not to be what you've seen before, but I would pick this thing to be squared. Why squared? Because then when I got the controller, I'd have a term down here that's squared. Okay? And then I would have a controller that it could actually implement without taking the second derivative. It, would, it, would be a, uh, it wouldn't be a PID controller, I can tell you that. But it would not take the second derivative of the error, which would be good. I'm telling you this now. I'm not liable to ask you to do it. You know, it's one of those. I'm, it's for your edification. It's not, not, a core issue, not a core issue at this point. All right. So I think we don't have much time. We got a little bit, but... Um, okay, so let me just try to do these two slides, and then we could start here. That would be very convenient. Okay, what if you have a time delay? Okay, so you have a process, and it has a part, and then it has a time delay. Okay, the 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 thing about time delays is you can't eliminate time delays by feedback. Time delays are design issues. So remember, I always draw that piping problem on the board. You can't get around the fact that it takes time for material to move down a pipe into a reactor. You can't get rid of that by control. It's not modifiable by it. It's a design problem. You don't like it, do redesign. So the idea is that now you have to take your desired closed loop transfer function to be first order just like before, but you just have to admit you're going to have to have a time delay in there because you can't get rid of it. So that means now your desired closed loop response looks like this. There's some time delay, and then it's first order, right? And this, this is the theta down there. You can't get rid of it. Just accept it, OK? All right. So man, this is, even I'm daunted by the number of equations here. That's the one I know I'm really tired. If I don't like equations, it's kind of like an alcoholic not liking beer or something like that. You know, <laughs> you know you've had too much, right? OK. Um, OK, so there's the, there's the GC equation I've given you before. And now what I'm doing is I'm just plugging in what? I'm plugging in this expression for GD. So what I'm going to call this GD here thing is it's GD star, which means the part of GD I like, let's say, which is the one over this, and the delay. I'm just splitting it into two things. so It'll be convenient to do that. So that's where the GD appears. It appears there. It also appears here. And then I have the one over G here, which is here. So where did the? Interesting. I'm trying to figure out where the time delay over there went. Must have canceled, but I don't know where it would have canceled from. Hmm. You see my quandary? I'm just plugging this equation into this formula, and all of a sudden there's no time delay down there. There, it's there. It should be. It's there, it should be. Where to go? I don't know. Huh. Oh, I see. Just a matter of nomenclature. I'm calling this the whole GD, right? So the GD really looks like that. I'm, uh, see, the idea here is that theta cancels that theta, so you can write it like this. I don't bother writing it in this form because it's not going to cancel. So I've just factored this into the two pieces. The part from the process cancels the one in the GD there, but it's not going to cancel here, so I just keep writing that as GD. Got the idea? OK. All right, well, that was a tough one. All right, so let's do an example here. Um, 